my name is Mariah and I'm the children's pastor here at a church called home. And I just wanna say thank you for joining us. We have a great service planned for you today. We truly believe God is going to speak to your heart wherever you're watching from. We're going to step into the worship part of the service just for a moment, and then we're gonna jump right into the message. Thank you again for joining us and welcome home. How many of you are thankful for the cross today? I know I am. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has the final word. Come on, lift it up again, church. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up his strongest fight, but the cross has the final word. Final word. We thank you, Lord. church lift this up today there's nothing stronger nothing The morning light, the cross 
has the final word. Come on, church. Lift up a shout of praise today. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name. Wow, I am so grateful for our worship team and our production team. They always do a fantastic job. I wanted to add one more thing before we go to the message. We love hearing from you here at A Church Called Home. We try to make it super easy to connect with us. If you text the words, Welcome Home to 94000, you can share a testimony, send in a prayer request, see our upcoming events, you name it. It's available by texting Welcome Home to 94000. If you are watching and you are in our area, we realize that before you visit in person, first you may visit online. We love our online services, but trust me, it's better in person. We've got a great message for you today. Go ahead and grab your Bible as we jump into God's Word. Like we do every week, a big shout out to everybody watching online. Come on. Thank you guys for joining us. Wherever you're watching from, thank you for tuning in. Today is going to be a good day. I want to start the message with a little experiment. I'm going to say a phrase, and I'm going to leave the last few words of this phrase out, and I'm going to see how many of you can finish the phrase. Here's the phrase, God is good all the time and all the time. Ooh, you guys grew up in the same church I did, right? Let's try it one more time. This time, let's say it with faith like we believe it. You just finish it. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Sound beautiful, man. You guys sound beautiful. We're going to do it a third time, but this time, everybody watching online, wherever you're watching from, we're asking you to participate as well. Open your mouth and finish the phrase. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Everybody sounds beautiful today. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. yes I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever gone through something that shook your confidence in that statement? Come on. Yes. There's a common denominator among a lot of people in the Bible, and that common denominator can actually be summed up in two words, remember me. Sure. Those two words were said by a lot of people throughout the Bible. Let me give you some examples. If you were to read Jeremiah chapter 3, then... When you, get to chapter, uh, when you get to chapter 3, verse 19, uh, you would hear Jeremiah say, Remember me in my affliction. You see, Jeremiah is a prophet that God called to go prophesy. And Jeremiah is prophesying. He's being obedient to the call of God. But what he sees is not what he hoped for. And so he's doing what God asked him to do, but while he's being faithful on his end, it doesn't look like God's being very faithful on God's end. And so Jeremiah cries out about chapter 3, verse 19, Remember me! I'm doing what you wanted me to do, and I'm not seeing the results I hoped for. Remember me. Uh, Samson if you go to Judges chapter 16, verse 28, man, Samson, God has a plan for Samson, a call on Samson's life. I mean, he has heard it growing up. His mama had told him every day of his life, there's something special about you. God's got a purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. But Samson just keeps blowing it. I mean, over and over again, he blows it. Now, his sin has caught up with him and he has been enslaved. He's in bondage, literally, physically. He has been enslaved by his enemies, and they, they have made a mockery of him. He's actually had his eyes burned out of his head, and he's chained up in this temple of this demon God, and they are using him like a freak show. And Samson, wondering if he has blown his last chance, he, he cries out in the book of Judges, and he says, Remember me! God, and strengthen me this one last time. Probably one of the greatest women in the Bible is a lady named Hannah. You can read her story in 1 Samuel. She's a good woman. She loves God. She, she serves God. She's a good girl. Uh, in, in Hannah's time, the favor of God was noticeably on a woman by how many children that she had given birth to. It was a sign that God's favor rests on your life as a lady. And she has gone from, from one baby shower to another. And every time she goes to a baby shower, she's reminded that God 
has yet to answer her prayer. And Hannah goes to the house of God. She is broken. She is confused. She believes God's good, but her confidence has been rattled. And she goes to the house of God in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, and she is so distraught and she is so broken and, and she is sobbing so much that the priest thinks that she's drunk. And she collapsed on the altar and she said these words, Remember me. I'm your maidservant. Don't forget me. Amen. Now, the book of Nehemiah is a really short book. But there are eight times in the book of Nehemiah that Nehemiah trying to do the impossible to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. He stops and he looks toward heaven and he says those two words, Remember me. I'm trying to do this because, God, you called me to it. You told me to come here. You told me to gather these people together. You told me to rebuild the walls. But, God, you see how hard this is. You, you hear what the enemy's saying, God. You see all the challenges. Eight times he cried out, God, remember me. Job, you want some encouragement? Don't read the book of Job. <laughs> Job, he, he stops at different points in his story and he looks toward heaven and he says, God, remember me. The thief on the cross looks to Jesus as he's breathing his last breath and he says, remember me. When you get to your kingdom, the common denominator among so many people in the Bible is they said those words, remember me. Why did they say those words? Because it felt like in that moment that God had forgotten them. Why else would you say, remember me? If you had not felt like God had forgotten you. Today we're going to kick off a new series titled, Ever Wonder Why? Have you ever scratched your head? Have you ever wondered why? And today I want to deal with the question, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't God answer my prayer? And I want you to close your eyes with me and put your hand on your heart, please. And we're going to pray. Father, we believe today that you are good. We would not be here today if we didn't believe that. We are here because, God, we truly believe that you are a good God. And your word says that the earth is full of the goodness of our God. But Lord, I realize that there might be, chances are high that there might be somebody in the crowd or Somebody watching today, and God, their confidence in that statement has been rattled. And I pray today, and I pray over the next few weeks, that you would pull them close, and that God, there would be some, there would be some period where there's been some question marks. There would be an exclamation point where there have been some question marks. There would be joy where there's been confusion. In Jesus' name. And the church said, if you know me, you know I believe in the power of prayer. I believe nothing is more powerful than prayer. I believe that God moves when His people pray. Daniel was one guy. When Daniel started to pray and fast, all of heaven moved and responded to one guy's prayer. Joshua was one guy. God, but when he stopped on the battlefield in the Old Testament and pointed to the sun and demanded it to stand still, it stood still for a day. He was one guy. But heaven moves when people pray. Heaven responds when people pray. And those are examples of how God moves when His people pray. Nothing lies beyond the reach of prayer. Prayer makes all things possible. Prayer can be powerful. But it can also be puzzling. I'm going to say that again. Prayer can be powerful, but it can also be puzzling. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. If you're new today, we are people of faith. We are people who believe in the power of prayer. We're people who believe that Jesus still heals. Jesus still sets free. Jesus is still setting people free from addiction. And we believe that Jesus still heals. And, and, and we believe Jesus can still raise the dead. We believe all of that. We believe this book. But all of us are real people who have all gone through things that have made us scratch our head. That's why I say prayer is powerful, but it can be confusing. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, our son, Chaz, he has always loved 
bouncing on a trampoline. Jumping on a trampoline, that is his thing. If you go by our house right now, chances are really high that uh, you will see him in our backyard on a hill, on a trampoline, jumping any hour of the day up into the night. Like, like if you're looking for him and he's not in his room or he's not you know, at class or whatever, then, then he's on the trampoline. When he was a kid, that was his thing. He would come home from school and he would be on that trampoline till dark and we'd say, hey, boy, you got to come in here. You can't eat your dinner on that trampoline. Okay? You got to come in the house, eat dinner. You can't sleep in a sleeping bag on that trampoline. You got to come in the house, right? That's not safe, okay? So he was always on his trampoline. When we sold our home and we sold everything in Kentucky where we lived and moved to Tennessee to start a church called home, we had to sell everything we had except for what was absolutely essential because it took nearly $100,000 to get ready to launch a church called home. We were the primary investors in launching and birthing a church called home. And we had to give up the trampoline. Two reasons. Number one, we moved in this small little apartment and the apartment complex would not allow us to have a trampoline because it was a liability. All the kids in the community, what would be on the trampoline? Somebody's going to break an arm, right? A leg. It's going to be Lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, we had to sell the trampoline. Number two, we needed the hundred bucks. Now, if you were to ask me and Melissa for the few years, the first few years after we lived here, if you were to ask us what hurts your heart the most right now, we would both say our son doesn't have his trampoline. And it wasn't fair that he had to lose something so that his mom and dad could be obedient to what God was putting in their heart. That just didn't seem fair. So as soon as we bought our house that we're in right now, the first thing we did when his birthday rolled around, we bought a trampoline. Now this is all pre-2020, but for some reason there was a trampoline shortage in the U.S. So I couldn't find a trampoline. And I wanted not just any trampoline, not like a single just do, 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 like three foot diameter. I wanted a trampoline bigger than the one he had. Right? I wanted him to be in have an upgrade type deal, you know? So I'm, I'm looking everywhere. I can't find a trampoline anywhere. All I can find is these little bitty trampolines. And I mean, who wants that, right? And so I finally, after searching the day before his birthday, I found a trampoline. One trampoline on the other side of town, Academy Sports, had this trampoline. So I went and I bought it. Only one they had. I get home. I open this huge box. I dump all the contents out. I spread everything out in the backyard And I start to assemble this trampoline. The next day is his birthday. We're having a birthday party for him. He is going to be so stoked that he's got a trampoline again. I get about halfway through the assembly, and I'm doing the math, and I'm thinking, I'm a leg short. I have searched everywhere. This is the only trampoline I can find. Tomorrow's his birthday. I go over, I look in the box. There's nothing in the box. I dumped everything out of the box anyway. I know there's nothing in the box. I'm thinking maybe I'm miscalculating. I need to finish putting together this trampoline. I I finish putting together a trampoline, and I am one leg short. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm going to give a disclaimer. If you don't believe what I'm getting ready to tell you, I don't blame you. There is no judgment. Because if I was sitting there listening to what I'm going to tell you, I don't know that I would believe it. Okay, I've wanted to tell you this testimony ever since this happened years ago, but it just doesn't feel right until now. Now it feels right, okay? So here's what happened. I finished putting the trampoline together. We're one leg short. And so I know there is no leg in that trampoline box, so I pray. I pray. I pray, I say, Father, thank I don't remember exactly what I prayed, but I prayed something like this. Father, thank you that you can make legs grow on people. You can make a leg grow on a trampoline. Thank you, God, that you can raise the dead. If you can raise a dead person back to life, you can make a trampoline leg appear. God, I think if you can open blinded eyes, a trampoline leg's nothing to you. And so I pray, I go over, look, and there's nothing in the box. We're still a leg short. So I ramped it up. I start to pray. I'm pacing in the backyard. I'm saying, now this time I'm praying in tongues, like I'm praying in the spirit, man. I'm going next level with my praying. And I'm praying and I'm praying. Thank you, Father. I'm every now and then stopping and worshiping a little bit, shaking you. Woo! We're getting, we getting, we going next level with this prayer. And I go over, true story. I go over, I look, and there's nothing in the box. Third time, man, I'm doing Jericho marches in the backyard. Man, I'm I'm determined God's gonna do a miracle. And, and, and my, my wife's looking out the sliding glass door at her husband, like, 
What in the heck is he doing? She don't know, but we need a miracle right now. We need God to move right now. Now, if you don't believe this, I don't blame you, no judgment. But I pray, I'm praying, man, I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm stopping, I'm worshiping, I'm declaring in Jesus' name, there is a trampoline leg there. Jesus, you said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. That trampoline brings joy to my son. If it brings joy to him, it brings joy to you. It brings joy to me. I go over a third time, and when I look, the cardboard bottom is popped up a little bit. Just a little bit. Where I could get my fingers in it. I thought, no way. I put, true story, don't believe me? I don't blame you. I put my fingers underneath that cardboard, raise it up. There is a trampoline leg under that cardboard bottom. It was not there. Some of y'all don't believe me. That's okay. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But I'm telling you, that's Jesus' trampoline. That trampoline will never be sold. It'll be at the Creech House until we all go be with Jesus. Prayer is powerful. But it can be puzzling. Let me explain. 12, 13 years ago, I have a family member. Stage 4 cancer. No hope. No hope of surviving. She's dying. We've been praying for her. And there's this one day that I really felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to go pray for her. Now, she lived two and a half hours away. But I feel it that day. Go pray for her. I called my uncle. I said, listen, I, I feel like today that the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. I need to come pray for her. Can I come and lay my hands on her and pray for her? I believe God wants to do a miracle. He said, come, come now. I get in the car and I'm driving two and a half hours and I'm praying, man. My faith is up. I'm feeling like, man... God's going to do a miracle and every person in our family that's not a believer, they're going to all come to Christ because God's going to heal my aunt. She's going to be whole. So I go, two and a half hours, man, I've been praying. I'm a man of super faith now. I'm ready. So I read to her a passage that the Holy Spirit put on my heart, Revelation chapter 1. If you were in our Easter service, you heard me read it last week. It's where Jesus said to John, he said, I am he that was alive, then I was dead. Now behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and hell. I read that passage over her, and I said, listen, do you know that cancer doesn't have the keys to death? That's right. That's right. Jesus has the keys. Yes. Do you know that the blood of Jesus, one drop of his blood, is more potent than every cancer cell that has ever been in any person's body? So do you believe Jesus can heal you? She's like, yes. I'm looking at my uncle. Do you believe Jesus can, can heal your wife? Yes. And I said, right now, God's going to do a miracle in your life. And I put my hands on her, and I prayed, and I walked away, and I believed with all my heart that God had healed her body. And two or three weeks later, she died of cancer. That's why I say prayer is powerful. It can be puzzling. What's a trampoline leg compared to human life? I'm talking real stuff to real people. I want to take a moment and I want to remind everybody of what prayer is and what prayer is not. So here's what prayer is. First and foremost, prayer is a means by which we fellowship with God. That, that's first and foremost. Prayer is a means by which we fellowship with God. Our, our prayer is relational. It's conversational. And as we pray, our relationship with God grows. It deepens. I want to give you something to think about. Before sin, before the fall of mankind, the Bible says that Adam would walk with God in the cool of the day. So let me ask you something. What was he praying about? You ever thought about that? Like there was no sickness. No financial needs. God, if you'll help me pay my cave payment this week. <laughs> right? There was no marital issues. God, this woman that you have given me. Now, I've never prayed that, but I hear other guys have to pray that from time to time. 
Like everything was paradise. What was he praying about? He was just talking to God. It's like, man, that hillside, Lord. God, that is beautiful. <laughs> what were you thinking? Where did you come up with that? Oh, the sound of the birds in the spring in East Tennessee, Lord. Wow, that is beautiful. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you just went on a walk with Jesus? Like, like not to ask for anything. And let me add that your prayer requests, they don't burden Him. He said, I know what you have need of before you even ask. But He still says, ask and you shall receive. Your prayer request has never burdened Him. He loves it when you come to Him with requests. But when's the last time you came to Him without a request? When's the last time you came to Him just to fellowship? God, can we just go on a hike together today? How beautiful. First and foremost, here's what prayer is. It's relational. It's a means by which we fellowship with God. Here's the second thing that prayer is. Prayer is a means by which we better understand God's will. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, holy, hallowed be thy name. And your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven prayer is a means by which we better understand his will if you read the story of when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane the first time he prays he says father if it's your will let this cup pass he prays for an hour and the will of God becomes clear and he says father if it's not your will then not my will but what Thy will be done. Your will be done. Prayer is a means by which we better understand God's will. In Jeremiah 42, 3, the Bible says, The Lord your God will tell you the way in which you would should... Uh, that, the way in which you should go, and the thing in which you should do. So, in other words, prayer is a way to better understand His will. Let me tell you what prayer is not. Prayer is not a means by which you can trick God into doing your will. Prayer is not a way in which you have this magical wand that you wave over and all of a sudden He becomes a slave to what you want. No, no, no. Prayer, first and foremost, is a way to fellowship with Him, deepen our relationship with Him, and number two, we better understand His will as we pray. Now listen to me very carefully. Do I believe God still heals? You better believe I do. And do I believe it's His will to heal? Listen to me carefully. You better believe I do. He bore stripes, according to the book of Isaiah, for you to be healed. If you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, it's brutal. I watched it one time. We had plans. We had some plans with some friends. The movie debuted and we were like, hey, opening night of The Passion of the Christ. So we made plans with our friends, Dennis. We said, we're all going to go watch Passion and then we're going to go eat pizza afterwards. And for 30 minutes when that movie was over, I wept. And said, God, forgive me. Forgive me for what my sin did to you. And there was no eating for the next couple of days. It was gruesome. But as gruesome as that movie is, it's still not the perfect picture of how hard he suffered. And the psalmist said that his benefits of that suffering was healing. Now here's the deal. If he'll go through that to pay for the healing... The healing is the joy that comes from the price He paid. It's His will to heal. There's a story in the Bible where one person said, If it's your will, one leper, if it's your will, would you heal me? And Jesus said, He answered the question, I'm willing. But here's the question, what do you do when you pray and you pray in faith? But you don't get the outcome you prayed for. Are y'all with me today? Let me talk to you about faith for just a moment. Look with me at James chapter 5, verse 14 and verse 15. The Bible says, Is anyone among you sick? If they are, let them call on the elders of the church and let them pray over that person. Anointing that person with oil in the name of the Lord. Now notice verse 15. And the prayer of faith. Everybody say faith. faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Faith is important. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But, and I'm going to give a bunch of buts today. 
But if we're not careful, we will put all our faith in our faith. And when all your faith is in your faith, all the pressure is on you. Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in our God. I said our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in God. I'm going to say it again. Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in God. Is faith important? You better believe it is. Is it vital? You better believe it is. But if you put all your faith in your faith, then when you pray for somebody and the end result isn't what you had faith for, then the enemy comes and says, if you'd have had more faith. Now I'm preaching real good right now. I got to amen myself every now and then. Well, if you'd have had more faith, the reason that happened is you just didn't have enough faith. No, no, no. My faith is not in my faith. My faith is in Him. So here's what we do, church. We pray, and we pray in faith. And then we give the results to Him. Because He is a sovereign God and He sees what we don't see. So we pray and we pray in faith because it's God's will to heal. But we give the end result to Him. Um, why does God move and grow a trampoline leg? And my family member die. I, I don't have all the answers. But I know He's a good God. He's a powerful God, and when we pray, God moves. And God always answers prayer. It's either yes, no, or I have something better, trust me. So, if you've ever prayed a prayer that didn't end the way you hoped it would, I'm going to give you three things that I'd encourage you to do. You ready to take notes? Because 100% of the people that take notes in church, they go where? They go to heaven, right? So everybody wants to go to heaven. Three things, if you've ever prayed a prayer and you didn't get the outcome you prayed for, I'd encourage you to do these three things. Number one, I'd encourage you to start making a list of answered prayers. Like every time God's ever answered a prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to remind you of things He's done. I have a list. It's pages long on my phone of prayer requests that God has answered. And I do that for two reasons, probably more like three. Number one, it turns disappointment into praise. Right? Number two, when I'm praying for something big and the devil's saying, that ain't never going to happen. Doc, that ain't going to happen. You can forget that. Well, I go to my answer prayer list and I start reading and faith just rises up. Oh, I forgot about that, man. God did that. I remember when we only had one car and that car was acting up and we were both working full time and a guy we had never met who worked for somebody who, who we, we had a mutual friend he, my, our mutual friend called me and said hey listen my, my friend has never met you a day in his life but I was telling him about you and the next day he came to me and said I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me last night in my sleep in a dream and he told me to give my car to your friend and he called and said come pick up the car and I was thinking it was an old jalopy like a my hoopty dragon pelt you know my sir mix a lot I don't know how that song goes but anyway I thought it was going to be a piece of junk and I got there and true story it was a Mercedes station wagon like sweet ride I was like what God why why God, why, why would you grow? Why would you love me so much that you would make a trampoline leg grow? God, why? I remember when God did things that only God could have done, right? And so when I need God to do something big and everything in my head saying it's not going to happen, I go to my answered prayer list and I just start saying, my God, you've been so good. This is nothing to you, Lord. Look at all you've done. Yeah. When you make an answered prayer list, you realize God answers prayer. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is I'd encourage you to talk to God about your disappointment. Like, don't let the disappointment... Put distance between you and God. He's near the brokenhearted. That's what the Bible says. That's right. So if you're brokenhearted, if you're disappointed, if you're confused, if there's a question mark in your heart, God, why did you do that but you didn't do that? And this over here is nothing, but God, over here this was so much bigger, but God, He's nearer. He's closer than you think. So press in. Don't back up. Press in. Here's the third thing I'd encourage you to do. I'd encourage you to pray again. 
Naaman, the leper, went to the prophet. The prophet said, here's what you do. You go wash seven times in the Jordan and you'll be made whole. You'll be healed. First time, no change. Second time, no change. Third time, no change. Fourth time, no change. Fifth time, no change. Sixth time, no change. But he washed again. And he was whole. Elijah prayed seven times that it would rain. First time. He tells the king. He gets on CNN. He gets on Fox. He he gets on every news station. He says, guess what? It's not raining three and a half years. It's going to rain today. Now that's putting yourself out there. He prays. No rain. Prays a second time. No rain. Third time, no rain. You, you better know. He was like me in that backyard. Man, he's pacing now. He's like, uh-oh, snap, right? Come on, Lord. Don't make me look bad right now, right? <laughs> he prays a seventh time. His servant said, I see a cloud out there on the horizon the size of a person's hand. What do you do when you don't get what you want? The outcome you believe for, you pray again. Let me tell you one more story, and then we're going to pray. Right after my relative, my family member died of cancer, I get a phone call from another family. And I knew the family. I knew some people within the family pretty good, but I didn't know the immediate family around this situation. Uh, I get a phone call, and this family member has had a brain aneurysm. And all I knew at that time of a brain aneurysm is growing up, I had a friend that lived across the street from me, and he and his dad, we were in elementary school, and they were fishing on a Saturday, and it was just he and his dad, and, and his dad had a brain aneurysm. And if you have a brain aneurysm, you're, you're, you're gone, right? You're gone, and his dad died. And it was so traumatic. I mean, can you imagine being a kid in elementary school fishing with your dad, just the two of you on the lake, and, and your dad die like that? Can you imagine? It was so traumatic. And now I've prayed for, for my relative and she's died. And then I get this phone call. Hey, we've got this family member. She collapsed. She had a brain aneurysm. And, and we immediately called 911 and we were with her. So we started chest compression. And somehow, somehow by the grace of God, she still has a pulse. Her blood is still flowing through her body. But they're telling us that she's gone. There's no brain activity. Will you come and pray? They're going to pull the plug. My faith wasn't at its all time. Hi. I just prayed for somebody and I believed and, and what I believed for didn't happen. Am I talking to real people today? So I drive to UT Hospital and I feel the Holy Spirit nudging me to read the same passage of Scripture from Revelation 1 over that situation. So I get to the waiting room and and I'm saying, do you believe God can do a miracle? And the family's like, we're believing. They're weeping, but they're saying, we're believing. We, we believe God can do anything. And so I read Revelation chapter 1. The whole time I'm reading this, I'm thinking about a few weeks ago what happened. But I said, listen, that brain aneurysm, whatever's going on in her body, it doesn't hold the keys to death. Jesus does. Let's pray. And so we prayed, and I left. And before I got home, I got a phone call. Her eyes have opened. They're saying it's involuntary movement, but it's hope. The next morning, she's looking around. The next day, she's talking. The end of the week, she goes home, and she is to this day 100%. God did a miracle. He did a miracle. So if you're here today, and there's a question mark somewhere in your heart, in your faith, and you've prayed something and it didn't end up the way you hoped it would, do those three things. Make today a list of answered prayers. Lean in. Don't pull back. Lean in and pray again. Don't lose faith. Will you bow your head with me? Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. If today you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're away from God, I'd love to pray for you right now. And it's as easy as opening up your heart and saying, God, I need you in my life. At a church called home, we call it making a new start. That's what happens when you say yes to Jesus. So come on, if that's you, why don't you just pray with me? Go ahead and bow your head and let's pray together. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I'm inviting you into my life. 
Forgive me of every wrong I've ever done. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Today, I'm making a new start. In Jesus' name, thank you for saving me. Amen. Hey, you know what? I believe when the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. I believe the Bible means that. So I want to ask you to do me a favor. If, if today you prayed that prayer, would you text the words, Welcome Home to 94,000? And you can check that you gave your heart to Christ. And I'd love to send you one of my latest books. It's called Making a New Start. And it will be a blessing to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Can't wait to see you next week. God bless and welcome home.